Good morning. Welcome to Kildonan Community Church. I'm Darlene Overby, a member and clerk of session here at Kildonan. We're glad that you're worshiping with us, whether in person or online. The Christ candle has been lit as a reminder that Christ is the light of the world. There's also a ring of Lenten candles with one less being lit each week as we approach Good Friday. We acknowledge that we are gathered on Treaty One land, first entrusted by Creator God to the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Red River Metis. This Friday, March 29th, is Good Friday. Kevin Pauls will be leading the service at our usual time of 10.30. Then we'll have Reverend Brenda Fraser with us on Easter Sunday. Please plan to join us at these special services if you can. We appreciate your presence and your support. We have a Lenten reading that we'll, lead responsive, we'll read responsively now. Being Palm Sunday, there's mention of palm branches. We don't have palm leaves or palm branches, but we always have with us the palms of our hands that we grasp in prayer. So let's wave the palms of our hands when the time comes to wave. On this Palm Sunday, we see Jesus entering Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, showing us the way of peace. With palm branches in hand, we cry out, Hosanna, save us now, save us from our warring madness. We affirm that God is at work when people are ashamed of the inhumanity of war and work for peace with justice. We pray for peace to him who is the Prince of Peace. Today, we're very pleased to welcome back Reverend Kevin MacDonald. Kevin hails from Nova Scotia and has lived in Halifax, Montreal, and Winnipeg for the last 18 years. He has served as, as, as minister at St. John's Presbyterian and First Presbyterian Churches and now works full-time as a marriage and family therapist at Riverbend Counseling. Kevin's interests include spirituality, psychotherapy, art, language, and cats. Thank you for being here, Kevin, and we look forward to the words you have for us today, starting with the call of worship. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. As you can see, my printer didn't work, so we're going to plan B. Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus is coming. Hosanna. He comes to us riding on a donkey. <clears throat> Open wide the gates. Hosanna. Let us welcome him with branches and songs of praise. Jesus is coming. Hosanna to the King of Kings. I invite you to stand that we may sing together our opening hymn 214, All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
please be seated. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of grace and truth, we gather in humility and hope because we believe you have the power to change the world, to change it for the better with your love. We gather because we believe no one is beyond your concern. No one is beyond your embrace. Such love astounds us. Without your grace, we cannot even imagine such love. In this hour of worship, inspire us with a vision of your love, which will change the world and change our lives for goodness sake. Amen. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Let us come then before God and say together our prayer of confession. Gracious God, we thankfully remember the life of our Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. Yet we also acknowledge our failure to respond earnestly and faithfully to his witness. We often mistake Jesus for a mere earthly king, friendly companion, or problem solver, failing to see him as the ruler of all creation. We do not appreciate the depth of his passion and sacrifice on the cross, failing to acknowledge him as our way of salvation. Even in this season of preparation, we have not walked faithfully in the way of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, we pray, and bring us ever more fully into the joy of union with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please join me also in the assurance of pardon. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Let us now pray for God's blessing on our reading of the Holy Scriptures. Let us pray for understanding. God of mystery and majesty, your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. Send us your Holy Spirit speaking through the scriptures so that our thoughts and ways may be transformed as we encounter your living word in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us read Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2, 19 to 29, responsively. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, so that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us 
Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God, who has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 11, beginning to read at verse 1. When they are approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. God bless to us the reading of his holy word, and to his name be glory and praise. Amen. Uh, I invite you to stand for uh, a hymn. Pave the way with branches. Let us sing to God's praise.
Great expectations. Having at least a good expectation or two keeps you going through life. Hope makes it bearable when it's hard going. <clears throat> On the other hand, under certain circumstances, great expectations can cause problems if they are unrealistic or mistaken. We want it to be the way we want it to be, and if we hold fast too rigidly to how we want it to be, we will miss the signs of what it really will be. Rigid expectations can make us blind, if not delusional. Then we have to deal with the mess. Need I mention politics <clears throat> at certain times in history, including it increasingly appears in our time? The world seems to be going insane. You know this from relationships too. You found out by now that even the love of your life had a skeleton or two in the closet maybe a little skeleton or two, not big skeletons, but there is something in the closet nonetheless, and the love of your life isn't necessarily entirely perfect. <clears throat> and then there's the skeleton or two of your own. Now you've worked it out by now, but we all know sadder stories. Palm Sunday is a great occasion on which to remember our tendency to have mistaken expectations. What were they expecting on that day? Well, let's just review very briefly what actually happened. Jesus makes a high-profile entry into Jerusalem. In Mark's Gospel, this would seem to be Jesus' first visit to Jerusalem during his public ministry. He is followed and preceded by a crowd celebrating his arrival. He goes to the temple, looks around, then leaves, returning to Bethany for the night. It's clear from what is said and done here that great expectations have been mobilized in this scene. This is about something everybody has been hoping for and waiting for. <clears throat> well, what does make this scene so suggestive? Well, it's in Jerusalem, the holy city, where the temple is found, where the kings reigned, the prophets preached, <clears throat> and the worship of God was centralized. All the important things <clears throat> happen in Jerusalem. The time is uh, leading up to the Passover, the celebration commemorating God's greatest intervention in history so far, the freeing of his people from slavery in Egypt. You couldn't blame the people of Jerusalem for thinking they were enslaved again at this time, with a Roman governor calling the shots from Caesarea Maritima on the Mediterranean coast, but coming to Jerusalem several times a year to strengthen the garrison there in the fortress Antonia, to keep a close eye on things during all the major Jewish holidays which is why Pilate was in town at that time. So the longing that Passover evoked in the people of Jerusalem would be felt in the air as Jesus rode through the streets. The crowd quotes lines from Psalm 118, which, of which we read part. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord, O oh Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
The save us in the psalm is the Hosanna, as you probably know, of the crowd in the scene in Mark. This psalm is noteworthy. It was likely composed after the victory of Judas Maccabeus in the second century before Christ, who had defeated the foreign king and invader Antiochus, who had invaded Jerusalem and desecrated the temple. Judas Maccabeus drove the invader out and freed the people from foreign control. So it's a psalm of victory and conquest. Um, you could say Jesus is the conqueror, the one coming in the name of the Lord. And to make the point even clearer, Mark quotes the crowd doing their own improvisation on the words from the psalm, saying, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. It seems the crowd adds that. You could easily read into that that Jesus is the son of David, of the royal line, and uh, subtly or not so subtly, it is a royal welcome. The passage reeks of prophecy. The fact that Jesus rides a colt calls to mind the messianic prophecy from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The procession ends in the temple, where Jesus stops and takes a look around. This calls to mind the messianic prophecy in another Old Testament book, Malachi. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Finally, in terms of the narrative arc of the gospel, this occasion inaugurates the final dramatic week in Jesus' life. It is a big occasion. So Jesus was very clear that he had come to bring peace, not violence. But not many people heard that. Everyone really hoped for a violent end to Roman rule and the reign of a glorious kingdom of the son of David. Well, with a few exceptions who uh, had a good thing while Rome was there in Palestine. But generally, that is what was thought would happen and was hoped for. Peacemaking has always been much more difficult to do than violence and vengeance. The crowd who entered Jerusalem may have been followers of Jesus, who had come with him all the way from Galilee. Some commentators hold that out to be the case and the crowd who called for his death less than a week later before Pilate may have been the Jerusalem mob. There may have been different crowds. It's possible. But if so, where did those supporters go who were with him on Palm Sunday? Even his disciples left him. If they had heard Jesus say <clears throat> what he had come for, peace, not violence, they hadn't entirely believed him. Not yet. Not really. So they were right about one thing. Jesus was the Messiah. They were just wrong about what the Messiah would do. It's easy to be wrong when it comes to understanding who Jesus is and what he would have us do. It can even be easy to want to be wrong when it comes to understanding what Jesus would have us do. 
So, who is Jesus for me, and who is Jesus for you? What are you expecting? Fortunately, Jesus didn't come just once in the Gospels. He didn't stop there. Jesus keeps coming again and again, spiritually, at least, in Holy Communion, in our own spiritual calling. I thank thee, Lord, for my call, my recall, yea, many calls besides, wrote the preacher Lancelot Andrews. What does he call you to? Do you really want to know? Have you given it deep and serious thought? Probably, but do it again. Don't stop. Do it especially this week. I'm not sure myself. I really knew how to do that until fairly recently in my life. I'm still not entirely sure I know how to, but with God as my helper, I believe I'm getting closer. Just beware of thinking you already know it. You already know it all about Jesus and your life. Albert Schweitzer wrote at the conclusion of his landmark study of um, the uh, historical Jesus research of a century ago, I quote, he comes to us as one unknown, without a name, as of old, by the lakeside, he came to those men who knew him not. He speaks to us the same words, follow me, and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship, and as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. They shall learn in their own experience who he is. That is where the action is. That is where it matters. What was the experience of some of those who met Jesus or met him again or met him anew during Holy Week? What was Peter's experience of Jesus? That Jesus knew him far better than Peter knew himself. Maybe Peter should have paused and consider that more. He also knew Jesus ultimately as compassionate and forgiving. What was the experience of Jesus that the money changers in the temple had? Rather different there. What would Pilate's experience of Jesus have been? probably of a very remarkable individual who was pretty hard to know what to do with. The satyrian who appears in one of the Gospels at the crucifixion, what was his experience of Jesus? Truly this man was the Son of God. What about the, um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Above all, the uh, people who uh, staffed the temple. What was their experience of Jesus? Well, they were the prime movers to have him put to death. All kinds of experiences, unmistakable experiences, very much alive. Palm Sunday reminds us to consider carefully what we are expecting.
Now, I believe, do you collect the offering before the service, or uh, no, you collect it during? Oh, it's collected already. All right. Well, let us then pray to dedicate the offering. Lord Jesus, compared with the gift you gave for our sake, what we offer today seems so small. Bless our gifts with your love so that they accomplish more than we can even imagine. Bless our lives, too, so that what we do and say will show we have the commitment to follow you, whatever the cost. Amen. Let us now come to God and offer God our prayers of thanksgiving and of intercession for our loved ones, our world, and our community. Let us pray. In Jesus Christ, O God, you came to us in humility, reaching out to all God's little ones with mercy and compassion. You ask us to do the same. In gratitude for all the mercy and compassion we have known, we pray for those who find themselves in humble circumstances. Hear us as we pray for the unhoused in our communities and for refugees wherever they take shelter. For all who find themselves <clears throat> without enough resources to cope when necessary things are so costly. For those who live in isolated communities and lack the access, care, and technology that most of us take for granted. Embrace them, O God, in your mercy, and humble us, lest we put too much trust in our lifestyles as the source of life's goodness. Hear us as we pray for all those who have been humbled by unexpected circumstances, for those who face illness or injury, For those who know death or disaster, fear or failure. For victims of crime and those who suffer through the misjudgment or mistake of others. And we pray for those who suffer because of the consequences of their own actions and choices. Embrace them, O God, in your mercy, and humble us, lest we imagine we can live our lives untouched by trouble. Hear us as we pray. For all those who have not yet learned the lessons of humility. For those who live carelessly or drive recklessly, endangering themselves and others. For those who abuse the trust and power in their positions betraying those whose interests are in their hands. And we pray for those who mislead others to protect their own interests or indulge their fame with no thought for your consequences. Humble 
Humble them, O God, in your mercy, and humble us if we are tempted to ignore the responsibility you give us all to care for our neighbor's needs. Create in us the compassion and courage as we come to the cross with Christ, and in humility we pray the words Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, let's stand to sing our closing hymn, number uh, 204. Thou didst leave thy throne. Let us sing to God's praise. If any want to become my followers, Jesus said, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you always.